So this evening we are continuing our teaching on prayer, and tonight we are going to think about developing and maintaining um, a rhythm of daily prayer. Now when I say that to you, and you think of your prayer life, I wonder, does prayer frustrate you? Does it delight you? Do you feel like you couldn't live without it? Or does it elude you despite all your efforts, despite all your good intentions? Is it something that you feel that you just haven't got there yet? Do you think to yourself sometimes, am I doing this right? Is this the way everybody else does it? How can I do it better? And perhaps it's all of, the, all of the above, depending on the day or depending on the circumstances in your life. And I was at a gathering a few weeks ago and the speaker started to talk to us and uh, in his introduction, he named these two gentlemen. So we started and he told us, Martin Luther, Martin Luther prays two hours, prayed two hours every day. And then I read it in the book that he'd actually got it wrong because it said in the book I read he prayed three hours every day. And he said, you know, Martin Luther said that the busier my day is, the more time I need to spend in prayer. And then he talked about St. Patrick. And he said, you know, St. Patrick, St. Patrick prayed in the snow. Patrick got down on his knees and prayed in the snow. And I wonder how that makes you feel because to be very honest, my initial reaction to that, in my head, no, I didn't say it out loud, but in my head, I said, oh, come on. I says, I'm not leading the charge of the Protestant Reformation, and let me get the date right, 1517, nor am I trying to fight the Druids and Christianize the whole of Ireland. You know, these men lived before electric light was even invented. We look back and think these guys lived a, a simpler existence. They slept when it was dark. They got up when it was light. You know, they didn't know what it's like to live in a 24-7 world where the world has no off switch. And I wonder when, when somebody, uh, when even I said that to you tonight, did you have the same reaction? Two hours in prayer? Praying in the snow? Come on, Elaine. I couldn't be doing that. And Richard Foster says this. He says, many of us are discouraged rather than challenged by such examples. Those giants of the faith are so beyond anything that we have experienced that we tend to despair. But he says, rather than beating ourselves up over our obvious lack, we should remember that God always meets us where we are and slowly moves us along into deeper things. And when such a progression is followed, we can expect greater authority and spiritual success than what we are having at present. You see, I might not be leading a reformation in the church, but aren't we all leading a daily reformation in our own hearts to turn from falsehood, to turn from pride, to turn to truth and to humility? I may not be Christianizing or trying to Christianize the whole of the island of Ireland, but aren't we all in our daily lives, trying to live the gospel so as we influence those around us. And in order to do that, in order to do that, we need to go deeper in prayer. We need to be more persistent. Glynis was talking about that last week. We need to be more consistent in our prayer life. There's no other way. There is no shortcut. 
We're like shortcuts. We're like hacks, don't we? Well, there's no hack on TikTok that will tell you how to develop a deeper prayer life like that. There is no hack. If we want to have an intimate relationship, a fulfilling relationship, an effective witness as a disciple of Jesus, then we need to go deeper. We need to go deeper. But the question is, how much do you want it? How much are you prepared to go after it? How much are you prepared to sacrifice for it? The psalmist says, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. Can we put our hands on our hearts? Can we? Can I? And say, I pant after the Lord. Will we prepare to be patient as a fruit of the Spirit? Will we take that patience and wait on the Lord? Like everything, we want it instant. But when we're being patient, in the waiting, in the daily rhythm, that is when imperceptible things are happening in our soul. Preparations are being made deep down. His righteousness is being credited to our account when we turn up for those regular rhythms of daily prayer, of waiting on the Lord. And Isaiah says, this is a very familiar verse that you will know, they that wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They will soar. They will soar. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And Lamentations tells us the Lord is good. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. So we're going to read now. We're going to turn to Scripture and we're going to read about someone who waited on the Lord, who prayed constantly. And Glynis was in that book last week. So we're going to turn again to Daniel, to Daniel chapter 6. And we're going to read about political intrigue in the Babylonian Empire. This is what was going down in Daniel's day in the corridors of power. And really, I think the only word that kind of causes a bit of, I'm going to talk about or read the word satraps, and really government officials. So when you think about satraps, maybe think about MLAs. I don't think they were elected in those days, but we're talking about people, people in power, politicians, um, those who make the decisions. And Daniel has, has risen to power. Darius is now the king of the empire. And it says it pleased Daniel, or it's pleased Darius, to set over the kingdom 120 satraps stationed throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three presidents, including Daniel. To these the satraps gave account so that the king might suffer no loss. Soon Daniel distinguished himself above all the other presidents and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king, the king planned to appoint him over the whole kingdom. So the presidents and the satraps tried to find grounds for complaint against Daniel in connection with the kingdom. But they could find no grounds for complaint or any corruption, because he was faithful, and no negligence or corruption could be found in him. The men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel, unless we find it in the connection with the law of his God. So the presidents and the satraps conspired and came to the king and said to the king, O King Darius, live forever. 
all the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an interdict that whoever prays to anyone, divine or human, for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into a den of lions. Now, O king, establish the interdict and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and the interdict. Although Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he continued to go to his house, which had windows in its upper room, open towards Jerusalem, get down on his knees three times a day to pray to his God and praise him just as he had done previously. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So if we go back to chapter three in that book in verse 48, it tells us that that Daniel, Daniel had come from Jerusalem as an exile um, into Babylon. He was one of the nobility. Um, he was handpicked because he was handsome and he was an intelligent and he was going to be trained in all the ways of the Babylonian empire. And he rose up through, through those ranks and he became, whenever he was able to interpret the, the king's dream, uh, he became the, over the whole province of Babylon. He was the ruler and he was the chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. And then by the time we get to chapter six, um, Darius the Mede has swept in and he's now the ruler of the Babylonian empire. So, so Daniel has served under two Babylonian kings and then we have Darius and we see that Daniel is one of three presidents. So he's very, very distinguished gentleman in the land and he was going to be appointed over the whole whole kingdom and so we see this that uh, this uh, plan to trap him probably fueled by jealousy and they knew they knew they could find nothing in him but they knew the only way they were going to get him was through the loyalty and the commitment he had to his God. And so in the middle of the book, chapter six, there's 12 chapters, right in the middle of this book, we get the key, the key to Daniel's life. And that's where it says, although he knew the document had been signed, he continued, he continued to go to his house. He continued to get down on his knees, probably knew they were watching him, but he wasn't gonna be intimidated. Three times a day, Daniel got down to pray to his God and to praise him. And I think when we look at this story of Daniel, we see a number of principles. Um, Principles to encourage us, yes, to challenge us. They do challenge us. You wanna be challenged, don't you? Christian life's not easy, we need a challenge. They encourage us, but they're not here to intimidate us. They're not here for us to say, oh, come on, that's Daniel and that's not me. We can take these principles, we see that that Daniel, that worldly success didn't go to his head. In all the finery, in all the promotions, in all the success and the influence that he must have had, he didn't forget where he came from. He didn't forget who he was. He didn't forget his God. And he didn't give up on that connection that he had with his God coming to him three times a day to pray. And we also see that the pressure of the job didn't get to him. Now I know we think, and maybe we're right, because I say it all the time, that we're the, we're the generation that lives with the most pressure. We're the 24 seven generation, you know, pressure, pressure, pressure. We don't have time for, for to sit in silence. You know, we've got things to do. But Daniel would have had things to do. The pressures and the distractions for him would have been great if you were practically running the Babylonian empire. But he stayed connected. His daily times of prayer were so important to him. He didn't let them go by the wayside. And the other thing is that people knew he prayed. From this story, we see 
that they knew. Now, I am not suggesting in this, because I know we have the story in the New Testament where Jesus, where the, the Pharisees held up and we shouldn't pray for approval. We shouldn't pray to be recognized. And we are told to go to our room and pray to our Father who is in secret. But the thing is, if prayer is important to us, if we have a daily routine of prayer, those around us will see it. You may talk about it. If it's something that's important to you, it just naturally comes out. You will say, I will pray for that, or I was praying about this. The Lord answered that prayer. It can't help but come out if it is a regular thing in your life that you do. So it's not that you're praying, I'm saying you need to go and pray in the street corners for everybody to see you. But the people around you, the people closest to you, should see that your prayer and your, the, the rhythm of your prayer is important to you. There was one morning I was praying at the end of the, the kitchen bench as I did in Cross Scar, and I was praying like this, so I would have had my hands on my head and my, my elbows on the bench. And you know the way sometimes you just, you can feel a you sense of presence beside you? And I'm praying, I'm praying and I'm thinking, oh, there's a presence beside me. And I was, oh, you know, Am I going to take my hands away and there's going to be an angel beside me? Honestly, I thought that. And I'll take my hands away and it's Emma standing beside me. Quite quiet, at least my, my daughter, for anybody who doesn't know. And she just knew mommy was doing her prayers and she would just stand there until I, had, until I had finished. So those that I live with see that my prayer uh, time with the Lord is important. We also see that Daniel's rhythm was so regular and so necessary to him that it was the fabric of his very being. And I wonder, is, is our prayer life the fabric of our very being? Is it like the spine that runs up our middle? And it was so necessary and so regular to him that he would not give it up under any kind of pressure or under any kind of intimidation. It was vital for him. And you see, the thing is, the more we pray, the more we come to rely on it, the more we realize its power and its strength, that it connects us to the Father, that it's through this regular prayer time with the Lord Jesus that we learn to live out of His mighty power that flows through us every time we turn, every time we go to Him. And then the thing is also that the more we pray, the more God reveals to us, the more we discover about him, and the more he reveals his secrets to our hearts. And with that, God becomes more real to us and more overwhelming to us to the point that we would rather die than be without it. Daniel was prepared to go to the lion's den before he would give up on praying to his God. But what I find most interesting about, about this particular passage, this book, and what I find most encouraging, and what I hope encourages you this evening is that when I sat down this week, I read the book of Daniel in an hour. There's only 12 chapters in it. I got a cup of coffee out, and I sat and I read 1 to 12 in an hour. But when you look at the, the, the time frame of the book of Daniel, 70 years. I read 70 years in one hour. And so when you read this in one hour, you see that Daniel has this extraordinary episode with lions. And then you see what, what Glynis was reading to us last week. He has this vision of the ancient of days. He's in the heavenly courtroom where the books are being opened sees the Lord Jesus in glory. And at the end of the book, he has the vision of the end times. You see, the thing is, when I read that in an hour, I think, well, that all happens very quickly. You know, Daniel had visions where he had to take to his bed. And they happened over 70 years. So I think it would be fair to say that 
those highs, those extraordinary highs, those extraordinary visions. That ex what must it have been like to sit beside a lion with its mouth closed? Imagine. And this was all undergirded by a daily rhythm of prayer that I am sure on many occasions over 70 years, at times it was quiet, at times it was maybe monotonous, but he didn't give up. At times there were probably disappointments. He was in exile in Babylon and he wanted to go back. So there were frustrations in his prayer life. And you see, the problem with us when we read Daniel in an hour, and we think it should be like that all the time, that we should have highs in our prayer life all the time, that we should have visions and, and words and fuzzy feelings. And then the problem is when that doesn't happen, well, we just think, well, well prayer doesn't work. <laughs> well, it doesn't work for me. Maybe it works for Daniel. Maybe it works for somebody else. But it doesn't work for me. And then what do we do? We give up. We give up. And when we give up, we miss, we miss the delight of those little exchanges and that slow, successful progress in the same direction, even if it feels like one step forward and two steps back. Because even if you're going one step forward and two steps back for a long enough time, you're still going forward. You're still progressing. And it is that grit and that patient determination that brings the reward, that brings the pleasure that you would not exchange or give up for anything. You know that the Lord of the universe is speaking to you. He loves you. And he wants his spirit to flow through you. Nothing, nothing compares to that. But like anything, anything of value takes commitment and it takes perseverance to keep going, even when it seems like you're getting nowhere. Now, I want to get practical now, and I want you to watch a little clip um, that Dave has kindly put together for me, because I think this really paints a picture of what prayer is, what it requires, that it requires dedicated practice. It requires, or it doesn't require, but it, you experience at times helpless frustration. But it also takes you to great highs from time to time. So as we watch this, this little video, uh, before it starts, I just want to say to you, because when I watched it, I thought, what was that? So Jerry Kelly does not take the Lord's name in vain, okay? Jerry Kelly says, gee whiz, okay? Just so as that doesn't spoil it for you, because it nearly spoiled it for me. Uh, so Kay is going to play this for us just for a couple of minutes. What's the best part of your game? You're chipping. Go ahead, work away, work away. Chipping or uh, putting or what? Chipping. Chipping? Yeah. Do you want to be a professional golfer when you grow up? Yes. Who's your favorite Darren golfer? Darren Clark. Darren, isn't it? Give us a wee yeah. go at that then. Do you know why I was the under 10 champion? <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> come on, come on back, Rory. Come back and go. Uh, I lied, I was 32 at the time, but I... <laughs> go on, have a go. You're just rimming out all the time here. Let's strangle on it. And now Rory, uh -oh. look out. Is that over there? What? Find a way to get it back on the map. Wow. Oh, look at this running down. Yeah. Spectacular. Back to 10. And the third. Easy. Easy. Better be careful oh, left going again. Left again. Oh, my goodness. He's oh, this that, one. That could be on McElroy's fourth shot. He's got to get up and over this little tree. And that hit it. 
11 to really put you back on an up, upward spiral. His fifth shot finally finds the surface. Salvage is six. The misery is over. It's ended with a triple. score of 271, the winner of the gold medal and the champion golfer of the year is Rory McIlroy. I think I'm, I'm proudest of the way I handled my emotions. I'm proudest of how I gathered myself when I needed to, proud of how I kept it together, even when it got a little tight. It was disciplined, it was hard fought. You know, I didn't run away with it. You know, there's a lot of stuff that I should be proud of. And when I look back on this win, that's what I'll, that's what I'll think most about. I wonder, has that happened to any of you on the golf course? I know there's at least one golfer in here this evening. Um, he says he wants to be a professional golfer when he grows up. You know, do we want to be disciples of Jesus? Will we have the same single-mindedness of just trying to hit golf balls into the washing machine? Practice, practice, practice. And he did become a professional golfer. And then it all went wrong. He was within grasp of getting his first green jacket at Augusta, and he ended up hitting balls off, go off trees. And isn't that sometimes how our prayer life is? That we feel like our prayers are just bouncing off the walls, bouncing off the ceiling. But yet, in 2014, when he lifted the claret jug and he, and he said those things, he says, I gathered myself when I needed to. I kept it together when it got a little tight. It was disciplined, it was hard fought, and he lifted the jug. But then he might have gone out the next morning and hit a round where he couldn't have hit a ball for love nor money, because isn't that the way it goes? And that is a little bit like a picture, a metaphor of what our prayer life is, but we keep going, we keep going, we keep turning up, we keep lifting the golf clubs, we keep turning up at the driving range and keep practicing. And there was, C.S. Lewis replied to a lady, he was doing the circuit and doing his, his talks, and this lady wrote him a letter, and they've got the response that C.S. Lewis sent to her. This was back in 1952, so she was inquiring about prayer, and uh, C.S. Lewis writes back to her in very direct form. He says, you're not David, and no one has told you to fight Goliath. You've only just enlisted don't go off challenging enemy champions. Learn your drill. Learn your drill. And we learn our drill. Now, it might not be very exciting, but we learn, learn our drill by keeping a regular rhythm of patient openness to the Holy Spirit, practicing, listening, watching, waiting. And I'm going to suggest four things uh, that I find helpful because Clive asked that this be practical. So I'm sharing with you things that I find helpful. So the first is accessories, the second is place and position, and the last one is time. And just as a, a golfer needs different golf clubs to go different heights and different distances, needs different courses to hone his skills, so when we come to prayer, as much as habit and repetition is vitally important, so is creativity and variety. Don't get stuck in a rut. Don't get stuck in a bunker. Creativity and variety can be weaved into your regular rhythm of prayer and make it exciting and bring beauty and variety to it. Now, when I, I pray, my, my regular prayer times, 
Um, I will always have my Bible with me. Now, there are times when you're out in the street and something confronts you and you shoot up arrow prayers. But when we sit down to have that regular rhythm, and not that the Bible is an accessory, but I would always start, and I'm assuming that, that when we pray, we pray from Scripture. And I don't go at it randomly. I think it's very good to read systematically and to pray Scripture. So when you come to a story in Scripture, you pray yourself into it. You take these characters, you see what they're like, and you're maybe saying, Lord, could I be like that? Would you grow that in my life? Or you also come to Scripture and you can pull principles out of it. I mean, you're saying, Lord, I would love to be courageous for you. I would love to be bolder. So you take words that, that resonate with you and you, you hold them and you, you pray them back to God. But an accessory that I find very good is, is music. Um, and I think headphones, I've noise cancelling headphones and you flick the wee switch on the side and they just, they shut out. You go into a different atmosphere with them. And when you put those things together, the other Friday morning I was praying, I had my Bible, I had my coffee, and one of my readings was Psalm 45. And the title in the Psalm said, Ode to a Royal Wedding. Well, that had me at that title before I even started to read it. And it's a beautiful Psalm about a wedding and the groom and, and the bride in her, in her robes and celebrating the marriage of, could have been King David or, or whoever was king at the time. But it's layered with prophecy of that picture of the church, of the nations gathering at the consummation, at the marriage feast of the Lamb, when the bride of Christ comes before the Lord Jesus. And as I was reading this psalm, I noticed that the word glad kept coming up in it a number of times. And I thought, mm, that word glad, and I took that word glad and I prayed it and I said, you know, I'm so glad that you love me. I'm glad you revealed yourself to me. And then this um, piece of music came into my mind. I don't know whether some of you know it. It's a, I was glad when they said unto me. Does anybody know that? It's a really um, full orchestra one. Uh, really lifts your heart. And it's, it's Psalm 122. Um, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And I thought, oh, I'd like to hear that. I'd like to use that as worship in my prayer time. So I got out YouTube and I typed in, I was glad. And to my delight, which as you now know me, what came up? I didn't, I'd forgotten this. But the then Kate Middleton walked down the aisle to I was glad, as they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So I'd wanted to close my eyes and worship there. Was it, this was just too tempting. And it was a royal wedding, and I'd just been reading a psalm about a royal wedding. And I sat there with tears in my eyes, not because it was Kate Middleton. Look, I know all that royal stuff. It's not, it's silly. But I'm using it in that there I was, in this grand cathedral, as the music started, the, the groom didn't sit and sweat it the way we normally do in our services. The trumpets started to blast and out came the groom and he was processed into his position. And then the, then the bride and her father started this long walk down through the abbey. And the, the trumpets were blasting and the cymbals were crashing. And in that moment, I was in that bridal procession with you. This is my home church. This is my home family now where I've been for a number of years. And there we were with the nations progressing to the consummation of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I wonder, I wonder as I was thinking over this over the next few day, days as that happened on Friday, is that something that we're missing? Is that, is that a response? Is that something that I needed to bring to you this evening as I thought about this? Because I read then and at another time during the day that the thing that differs us between the church from the book of Acts was that Maranatha cry, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus. Do we, do, do, do we, do we, I mean, I love being a Christian. Do we like being Christians? Do we like, uh, like coming to church? Do we like our friends? What if the Lord came back? What if he came back right now? Is that our heart's cry? Do we need to repent that that's not our heart's cry? That we love him, but we're happy he's there and we just want him to stay there for a wee while longer until we have a nice life. Do we need to repent of that? Do we need to find that heart's cry in our souls again where it's come Lord Jesus, come now. 
I stood behind the communion table this morning and there's a line in the communion liturgy that asks, come Lord Jesus. And you know, as I say it, I think, oh, what would happen if he did? How wonderful would it be if he did? And then as I pull myself back from the excitement, um, another accessory for when you're praying is, is candles. You don't need words. It's beautiful to light. I love candles. Beautiful to light a candle and just sit and contemplate Jesus, the light of the world. Just rest in it. Just glory in it. And then some people write their prayers. I used to write my prayers. Um, when I worked in the, in the trust, I would write them in my diary. I don't do it so much now. But sometimes it's very helpful to write out your prayers. And then we think about place and position. It's good. It's very good to have a regular spot. And I have a regular spot in the house. But it's also good to break it up and have a change. It's good to get outside in nature. If you can get yourself to the beach, it's beautiful. Sit in your car, have a coffee. I, I think the, the, the water of the sea speaks to me of the deep, deep love of Jesus. Just to meditate on creation. And I like to go to the garden in Rowallan with my Bible and my coffee. Get out into nature, enjoy God's creation and, and talk to him there. And then we can change position. I wonder, have you ever tried to lie down prostrate? And just lie down before the Lord. Now, I would say it's good to have something here because if you spend too long like this, you end up with a crick in your neck. So I sometimes have something soft here. Um, but just to lie and to know your nothingness before the might of the Lord. And then there are times when words, life's tough and words don't come. And there's sometimes I would kneel at a chair and put my arms up on the seat bit of the chair and imagine myself with my head in Jesus' lap as he tenderly soothes me. And there's been some, not too often now, but a couple of times I've got up to pray and the words just won't come because it's too difficult. And I've got up onto the sofa and curled up into that fetal position where I just let him, where I try to hide in him, wrap myself in Jesus. So positions uh, are very good to break up just sitting with your coffee and your, and your Bible. But I think the most important thing um, is that we can play, pray at all times and in all places and in all situations. But one of the fundamental things is having a set time, like Daniel did three times a day. And it depends on your personality, whether maybe you like the mornings, you're better in the mornings, some people are better in the evenings, or three times during the day, three shorter sections, set your phone, or, or at lunchtime you go for a walk. And you just turn yourself, turn yourself into, into the Lord Jesus again. And Kai's going to put up another slide here because these are just, um, there's some prayer apps. I mean, really, we don't have any excuse today. You know, technology does work for us. It's not always out to get us. Um, and there's a, a brilliant app, uh, Lexi, you don't see it there, the wee turquoise one, Lexio 365, which is a seven-minute devotion, morning and evening. It um, doesn't take very long, and you can have it on your phone. Put it on your noise cancelling headphones if that helps. Um, the other, and I would have used that when I came, came here, because sometimes you can do it in the middle of the day and have three sessions. Sacred Space is a beautiful one. I used to use it when I was in the trust. I'd get in early get when the office was quiet, and I'd bring it up on the computer. And these are some of what I have found the best books on prayer that have really helped me and we'll leave them up after the service and you can you want to take that I think they're all available on Amazon and that last one prayercourse.org is on the 24-7 prayer if you google 24-7 prayer Pete, um, Pete Greggs um, and it's fabulous you can go in and you can bring up the daily exam and contemplative prayer meditative prayer just a page and they will tell you how to do it so it's a fabulous way if you want to try and add variety into your prayer life to look up that um, prayercourse.org. But as I finish, as I finish, you know, I love to walk around podium for sport. Anybody been in podium for sport? Even when I have to go in to buy Emma her mouth guard, uh, I just love going into that shop because when I go into that shop, you know, I feel like an athlete. I'm just surrounded by all the sports equipment. 
And I look at the swimsuits and the bicycles and the gym. I've even bought some of the weights. They're under the stairs, but I have bought them. Um, I love going over and looking at the running gear and the, you know, lifting up the colorful trainers. And I imagine myself in this gear, running, building up a sweat, getting all breathless and red-faced, my heart pumping. But do you know something? Till I actually put it on, until I actually go out the door, until I actually do it, you know, I might as well whistle to the wind as to think I'm going to fit into my old favorite pair of jeans. So I can talk to you about the rhythm of prayer, but until you commit yourself and persevere with it, you won't feel those pleasures. But it does take sacrifice and commitment, and we need to do it. And when we do it, we start to feel the benefits like the benefits in our souls. And it is worth it. And it will be worth it. So let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the invitation of prayer, for the intimacy that you long us to have. And so Father, as we, as we think about this, as we with all our efforts and our good intentions, Lord, would you take them? Would you take the desire and the hunger of our soul to know you more, to be a worthy disciple? Would you grow it in us, grow our prayer lives, grow it deep, and Lord, grow it tall and strong? Come, Lord Jesus, and help us. Come and make us ready. So as when you do come, we have spent beautiful time with you here in preparation for eternity with you forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.